Today we're going to talk about a special person, Martin Luther, the Man of Steel. Our Man of Steel is dedicated. Uh, Luther, thanks for coming uh, today. And uh, our historian says it was dedicated in 1976, and given in, in memory uh, of Dr. Adolf Strang, who was a Luther scholar at the time, and Dr. Evelyn Strang, who is still on our emeritus faculty. Uh, Martin Luther faith and reason, the foundation of the modern university. Sola fide, sola scriptura, 1483 to 1546. Do you know before Martin Luther, we were not allowed as a scientific community to dissect a human body, a cadaver? That we were still using a 1500 year old text by Galen, a first century uh, historian who based his anatomical text on goats and dogs and cats. So it was, first slide please. It was 30 years after Luther's treatise that the academic community opened up, the scientific academic community opened up uh, because Luther was a tenured professor and he wasn't fired even though the Pope wanted to excommunicate him. And because the college president at Wittenberg said, you are right. If it's not in the Bible, Jesus didn't say it, people. You can't make up purgatory and sell time off to get into heaven while people are dying of starvation and hunger and diseases. So Vesalius uh, became the first person to dissect and start naming the parts of the human body. One of my students in anatomy, not you, uh, said, this is boring, Dr. Squires learning all the names of the bones and all the muscles, I said, you think you're bored? I've been doing this for 31 years. <laughs> and I know the names of the bones and the muscles. Next slide, please. Ambroise Paré, surgery now takes on a valuable way because now we know what we're doing. We can call it different names. Left flank, diagonal, anterior, posterior. We're naming things. Next slide, please. Stanley Schultz, the president of the, or the professor of physiology at the Health Science Center in Houston, says the greatest uh, invention or discovery was by this fellow, William Harvey. And William Harvey adequately and expertly described the circulation of blood. Before, we had Aristotle uh, to rely on in his great book, The Parts of the Animal, where he thought that the heart was the center of the body because you could hear it. He thought that's where the soul rested. Well, I still don't know where the soul is, but uh, it's not the heart. Uh, next slide, please. Leeuwenhoek, the discovery of the microscope. Wow, the whole beginnings of microbiology, germ theory starts with this. What are those things under this glass? We cannot see them. So what do we start off with in freshman biology? How to work the Leeuwenhoek, I mean microscope. Next slide, please. Scurvy. Wow, vitamin C deficiency. And it was a good Jesuit priest, Francis Xavier, who left the Society of Jesus in Paris and went to China on an expedition. And uh, they were getting bit by mosquitoes. And so the locals gave him the chinchona bark to chew on, and it had quinine in it. And so Dr. Wasman tells me, he's no longer here to defend himself, the gin and tonic was born at that time. Because the sailors got a ration of grog, okay, and grog for the British Navy was gin. You put a little quinine in, it's kind of bitter, and you put lime in there. So it was a medicinal drink. Not that it's, I'm giving anybody privileges to have, have that. So, uh, scurvy, vitamin C deficiency. Next slide, please. Ah, oh, Padua, once again, Vesalius's uh, university. Uh, Morgani, the physician. Now, for the first time, what we have are observatories where young doctors can sit and watch the old doctors learn how to do medicine in a scientific manner and could call those names out. I'm still old enough where I sat in one of those observatories and watched Dr. DeBakey put in an uh, aortic valve. Now we don't have those, we have video cameras, we have cell phones. It's 
to do those kind of things. But that became important uh, in the development of uh, young doctors. Next slide, please. Lavoisier, who lost his head, uh, literally, uh, in the French Revolution. But his assistant sitting there in the chair with the mask on his face is Armand Seguin. People think that Seguin is a Spanish word. It's not. It's French. And for the first time, somebody measures the oxygen while someone is working. The father of exercise physiology. Lavoisier, he determined what a calorie was. The amount of heat necessary to raise one cc of water, one degree C. How many calories do we burn in a mile? Nolan? Hundred, correct. Okay, so that starts right then. The whole field of kinesiology, the study of movement, starts that. Last slide, please. Next slide, please. John Hunter, the founder of scientific surgery. Scientific surgery. In other words, publishing, writing your comments down, getting other people to review it. The scientific method. What, is the sci what does science mean? To know. It's almost a subjunctive of the verb shiri. I want to know. A scientist is one who wants to know. Why do I want to know? So I can help people. I can save people's lives. And that's what the modern physician. So the Reformation leads us into the Renaissance, leads us into the age of enlightenment, leads us into the age of scientific, now into the age of technology. Uh, I'm going to play a, uh, uh, a voice clip from uh, probably the most eminent scientist uh, today, Father George Coyne. Uh, George is a Jesuit at the University of uh, Arizona. And for 28 years, he was the papal astronomer uh, until the last pope, where, uh, and George would never say this because he's a good holy man, but uh, he doesn't believe in intelligent design or creationism. He believes in the great commandment, love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. So what is God? And let's see what Father Coyne has to say about that. Who is God? And my last question, in what ways has science informed your beliefs in God? Okay, first of all, I never came to believe in God through science, through any purely rational process. Faith, to me, is a gift from God. In fact, it's God's love for me, for us. And I follow what St. Augustine so often said that he said in his confessions, for instance, God, I searched you down the highways, down the byways, day and night, and I never found you until I discovered that you had found me. So the initiative is on God's part. That having been said, um, my science, therefore, did not bring me to God. But if I believe in God, then the knowledge I have through science certainly enriches it gives a richness to my belief in God. For instance, my knowledge of the universe says a lot about, if I believe that God created the universe, it says a lot to me about the God who created the universe because the universe that I'm investigating was made by God, so it should reveal something about God, and it does. A universe that has within it the evolutionary process says a lot about a God who shared with the universe his own creativity. He allows the universe to grow like a, a parent does with a child. You have to discipline a child, you have to teach it good manners, you have to teach it good morals, but eventually a parent has to let go and let an individual make their own choices and grow up. And I think, you know, it's a very weak image, but any time we talk about God is weak, nonetheless the point is that my science does say a lot to me about the God who created the universe, if, it's a big if, if I believe in God. Very powerful statement by a tenured faculty member who went back to his position at the University of Arizona. So Luther still is here. The founding of the modern university is between faith, my faith tells me that God created the universe. My reason says it didn't happen 8,000 years ago. So I'd like to introduce my fraternity uh, brothers, uh, Alpha Phi Alpha, come on up guys. Uh, and they're gonna give a, a brief uh, story about how Martin Luther has affected their fraternity and affected uh, what's happening in Washington today.
Thank you. Greetings. We are honored to stand before you today to speak on behalf of one of America's greatest historical figures, a diligent seeker of equality, as well as a notable figure in the civil rights movement, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Transcendent Excellence. He was the epitome of what Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated strives for, manly deeds, scholarship, and love for all mankind are the aims of our dear fraternity, which Brother Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. personified in his walk and his legacy. Dr. Martin Luther King was born Michael King, but his father changed his name to Martin Luther solely because he was inspired by the work of the reformists from the 16th century. Um, Martin Luther King Sr. was hoping that his son would have the same effect on society that Martin Luther did in the 16th century, and by the grace of God, he did. In order to honor Dr. Martin Luther King, Alpha Phi Alpha built a monument on the Washington Mall. This monument was built next to other iconic figures in U.S. history, such as the Abraham Lincoln Memorial and the Thomas Jefferson Memorial. This monument opened up just a month ago on August 22, 2011. After two decades of progression, Alpha Phi Alpha had finally succeeded had finally succeeded in establishing one of its most prominent members in American history. As a fraternity, we are proud to be a part of such a historical event of such magnitude. Thank you and God bless.